WLRN edition 76 broadcasting in three, two, one. I was born a woman off my knees. I will stand for my liberation. Sisters rise again. I was born a woman off my knees. I will stand for my liberation. Rise and rise again. Greetings and welcome to the 76th edition podcast of Women's Liberation Radio News for this Thursday, August 4th, 2022. This is Aurora Linnea, biological female and reality enthusiast. This month's edition focuses on surrogacy. I had the absolute pleasure of speaking with both Jennifer Law and Dr. Renata Klein about the subject, and we'll hear excerpts from those interviews today. We'll also be posting full-length versions of these interviews soon, so be on the lookout if you'd like to hear more from Jennifer and Renata. The team at WLRN produces a monthly radio broadcast to break the sound barrier women are blocked by under the status quo rule of men. This blocking of women's discourse we see in all sectors of society, be they conservative, liberal, mainstream, progressive, or radical. The thread that runs through all of American politics, except for separatist feminism, is male dominance and entitlement in all spheres. To start off today's edition, we turn to WLRN's World News segment with our own Emily Ann Lorenzen for this Thursday, August 4th, 2022. Take it away, Emily. Thanks, Aurora. In China, public incidents of violence against women have shed light on the issues of misogyny and abuse in the country. On July 16th, a graphic episode of a woman being chased down, grabbed, and pulled to the ground at a bar was captured on a closed-circuit television camera, which sparked outrage on social media and renewed anger over violence against women. A woman on the popular microblogging site Weibo said, quote, As a woman, I may not dare go out in the dark, unquote. On June 10th, Four women were beaten outside of a restaurant, and two of the women were hospitalized. A senior China researcher at Human Rights Watch said, quote, The rise of women's consciousness in China is quite rapid, faster than a lot of other countries. So I think the feeling of threat from men is especially acute. Unquote. Women in Chile are rising up to support women who have fought back against their abusers. In September 2019, after years of abuse, Cynthia Concha's husband threatened to kill her and blocked their bedroom door as she tried to escape. In fear of her life, she fought against him and caused his death through asphyxiation as they struggled. She turned herself into the police immediately, and she was arrested while the investigation took place. In response, a nationwide grassroots campaign rallied for her freedom under the slogan, I'd defend myself too. In April, Cynthia was acquitted of all charges due to well-documented evidence of the abuse. Women's rights organizations in Chile celebrate her acquittal, but they warn that there are many more domestic abuse survivors who have been unjustly criminalized for defending themselves. The murder of a Mexican activist of a caregiver's rights group and mother of an autistic child has ignited protests, condemnation, and demands for justice. Luz Raquel Patilla was doused in alcohol by a woman and three men and set on fire at a park in Zapopan, Jalisco. The case is being looked into as a possible femicide. It is possible that her neighbor, who threatened her in May with messages saying, quote, I'm going to burn you alive, unquote, on her residential building's walls, is connected to the murder. Luce was under protective measures due to his continued harassment. 
Dozens of women held demonstrations in front of the Zapopan police station and accused authorities of inaction and indifference. According to official figures, an average of 10 women are murdered daily in Mexico. A popular Egyptian social media influencer, Tala Safwan, has been arrested in Saudi Arabia and accused of posting lesbian content on TikTok. In a clip, she is chatting with a female Saudi friend at her house, and her remarks to the woman have been interpreted by some as being sexually suggestive. Tala claims that that was not her intention, and that the clip has been taken out of context from the full video in order to cause a scandal. Lesbianism is still a public taboo in Saudi Arabia. This incident came just days after the Saudi media regulator demanded that YouTube remove advertisements that it considers offensive to the country's Muslim values and principles. And it threatened to take legal action if nothing is done. The London Police Services Board in Southern Ontario, Canada is gathering input from the public as it prepares to ask the federal government to add the term femicide to the criminal code. Megan Walker, who is spearheading the initiative and a former executive director of the London Abused Women's Center, said, quote, What we're trying to say to individuals is, when a woman or girl is murdered every 36 hours in Canada, this is a crisis, and it needs to be addressed. One of the first tools we know we can use to address it is by defining femicide and using it to pursue criminal investigations." Unquote. Once femicide is officially recognized as a crime, prevention efforts, public awareness, and criminal charges will be possible in the country. The German Justice and Family Ministries has proposed a self-determination law that would replace the 40-year-old transsexual law, which requires trans-identified people to receive a court order and two expert opinions to change their sex and name on official documents. The new proposal calls for a person's legal status to be changed through simple self-declaration, and to ensure that people are serious about the decision, another change will not be allowed for a year after the first change is registered. A survey carried out by YouGov for the Welt am Sonntag newspaper showed that 46% of respondents favor the proposal while 41% reject it. The survey was conducted over two days in July, and 1,796 people answered questions online. The proposal also states that teenagers over the age of 14 can submit the declaration themselves with their parents' consent. The survey found that 48% of participants rejected this part of the proposal, while 39% supported it. Legal records in Germany have three options for gender, male, female, and other. The Tavistock Center's transgender clinic in London will be shut down by the NHS after a review found that it is not safe for children. The cast review was commissioned by NHS England in 2020 amid concerns that there was scarce and inconclusive evidence to support clinical decision-making, which saw children as young as 10 given puberty blockers. The NHS said that it has recognized the need to, quote, establish regional services that work to a new clinical model that can better meet the holistic needs of a vulnerable group of children and young people, unquote. Two new clinics will be set up in London and in the Northwest and the NHS hopes to eventually run around eight regional centers that will follow guidelines from the CAS review. The Tavik Stock Clinic is set to be shut down by next spring. The FDA has placed a warning label on puberty blockers after six minors aged from 5 to 12 experienced severe side effects. Every minor was female and suffered from symptoms of tumor-like masses in the brain, including visual disturbances, headaches, vomiting, swelling of the optic nerve, increased blood pressure, and eye paralysis. At the 2021 American Academy of Pediatrics Conference, 80% of its members supported a resolution calling for, quote, more debate and discussion of the risks, benefits, 
and uncertainties inherent in the practice of medically transitioning minors, unquote. But no discussion has been had. The Assistant Secretary of Health in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, trans-identified male Rachel Levine, said last month, quote, Gender-affirming care is life-saving, medically necessary, age-appropriate, and a critical tool for healthcare providers, unquote. It appears that the tide is turning, and the one-sided rhetoric of trans activists is under scrutiny at the unfortunate cost of children being experimented on by the medical establishment. On June 26th through June 28th, the newly formed nonpartisan Independent Council on Women's Sports, or ICONS, brought together world-class female athletes, scientific experts, lawyers, and advocacy groups at a conference in Las Vegas, Nevada, to address the importance of keeping women's sports single sex. Notable speakers included tennis player Martina Navratilova and Olympic champions Inga Thompson, Benita Mosley, Donna D. Verona, and Sue Walsh. The ICONS conference followed in the wake of a recent rally in Washington, D.C. on Title IX, which under the Biden administration has begun to include provisions against discrimination on the basis of gender identity rather than sex. ICONS was founded by two former athletes, Kim Jones and Marshy Smith. The conference focused on delivering information about biology, law, and policy in an academic format. For the first time in 33 years, the Tour de France had a women-only race called Tour de France Femmes on July 24th through July 31st. Women cyclists have struggled for years to establish a Tour de France for women, but when the pandemic threatened the race in 2020, Zwift, an app that allows you to hook up your bike to a trainer and ride as an avatar in a virtual world, and the Amory Sport Organization, which organizes the Tour de France, teamed up to create a virtual race open to women and men with equal distances and prize money. The stats from the race prove that women can race as hard as men and that viewership did not change while the women were racing. The Tour de France Femmes had the highest cash prize in all of women's cycling at 250,000 euros. Alison Bailey, a barrister at Garden Court Chambers, or GCC, in London, and founder of LGB Alliance, was awarded £22,000 in her discrimination case against the GCC. The case was launched in 2020 when Bailey claimed that Stonewall had influenced her employer to withhold work from her as penalization for her gender-critical views and pro-woman activism. The court upheld her complaint against the GCC, but it did not uphold her complaint against Stonewall, which provided trans activist resources to her employer through its Diversity Champions program, as being a direct influence of the discrimination she received. This is the second major victory for British feminists this year. A few weeks ago, an employment tribunal ruled that women's rights advocate Maya Forstetter was discriminated against after her contract was not renewed following tweets she made on gender ideology. That concludes WLRN's World News segment for Thursday, August 4th, 2022. I'm Emily Ann Lorenzen. Share your news stories, announcements, and tips with us by emailing info at womensliberationradionews.com and let us know what's going on.
That was Xenia's with her song, Follow the Body. Next up, we'll hear excerpts of an interview Aurora did with Jennifer Lal, founder and president of the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network and co-founder of the international group Stop Surrogacy Now. Jennifer's award-winning documentaries include Breeders, A Subclass of Women, and Big Fertility both of which expose the brutal realities of surrogacy in the United States. Here, Jennifer explains the medical risks surrogacy poses for the women involved and refutes the common arguments made to justify the exploitation of women as wombs. I'd like to remind people that for the United States being such a superpower in the, on the world stage, we have already horrible maternal morbidity and mortality rates. You know, for a country like the United States, we should be quite frankly ashamed of, and and when I say morbidity and mortality, morbidity is just health complications related to to pregnancy and mortality is, you know, women who die in childbirth. We still have horrible rates uh, when you compare us to other countries uh, around the world. So we already know that pregnancy is not without risk, you know, and that this notion that, you know, well, pregnancy is just like, you know, something that women have been doing forever. Yes, but it is it's risky. And we're only learning recently since we moved in, in, you know, in the olden days, and I hate this term, we use um, the, the words traditional surrogacy, which I say there's really nothing traditional about it, but is it the traditional surrogate is the woman who is pregnant with her own child that's entered into a contract that when that child is born, she will surrender it to whoever. Um, so we've moved from that to the, the model of gestational surrogacy, which is where the woman is pregnant with somebody else's egg created embryo. So it could either, in the case of a, a gay couple, you know, the egg has clearly come from an egg donor, not because there's not a, a wife and, or a partner, a female partner in that situation. Um, or in the case of she's a surrogate for perhaps an infertile heterosexual couple, it might be that woman's egg that the surrogate is then, you know, pregnant. And we're seeing now because we've shifted more to that model and because we're having more and more surrogacy um, arrangements, children born this way, um, we're finding things in the medical literature that we know that these surrogate pregnancies, gestational surrogate pregnancies are high risk. And we, we think um, a couple of things are going on. One is if you think of like organ donation, you seem like a lovely person, Aurora. And I'm sure if you needed a kidney to transplant, you know, I would consider donating my kidney to you, but it doesn't work that way because you might reject my kidney and we don't just go around putting anybody's kidney into somebody because they want to help. You know, there's this thing called tissue typing and organ rejection. And so in the surrogate mother, her body immediately has an immune response to the pregnancy because her body says, this is not my baby. This is a foreign object in me. And so you'll often see surrogates are put on medication um, like steroids and stuff to sort of mitigate those inflammatory com- complications that she's having. Um, surrogates are often at risk because they've had multiple C-sections, you know, overwhelmingly C-section it deliveries, how a lot of surrogate babies are born. Even though, again, when you think of regular women, we try to, we've tried to move away from C-sections because we know that C-sections are, are risky um, to mother and child, um, surrogates overwhelmingly still deliver 
by surrogacy, I mean, by, by C-section. And surrogates often carry multiples. So you have, you know, these, these compounding risk, risk factors. But I do like to remind people that we've had surrogate mothers die in the United States that weren't carrying multiples. We've had surrogate mothers die that were carrying twins. Um, but, but that risk is not necessarily attached to whether it was a C-section, whether it was multiples, or whether it was this, you know, immune response to rejecting a foreign number. It's kind of all those things. And then we do see also that surrogates, um, in my own research, it's not uncommon to interview and speak to a surrogate that's given birth to six, seven, eight, nine children, because she's had her own children, and she's done two or three surrogate get pregnancies and maybe between her own children and her surrogate pregnancies, she's given birth to a couple of sets of twins or even triplets. We've had surrogates pregnant with triplets. So, you know, that compound compounds risk. And especially when the woman's body has not had adequate an, an amount of time to recover. So there was one surrogate who died in Boise, Idaho, and she was carrying twins and the twins died as well. And she had had really close interval pregnancies. And I think part of her complication, because she died of a placental abruption where the placenta just abruptly tears away from the uterine wall and you just have massive hemorrhage and it's really almost impossible to save that woman's life and the, and the babies. And this actually happens in an operating room, which it never happens in an operating room. So she was at home when it happened. And by the time she got to the hospital, she had bled out. But I think that was because her body hadn't had ample time to heal. And she was now carrying at that time, at that point, that was, I think, if she'd given birth to the twins, she would have given birth to six children. And she'd had several C-sections. And, you know, and the human body can only take so much. You know, and when you look at some of these surrogates who are what I call serial surrogates, and they do it again and again and again, because one of them, the money, and they love being pregnant, they love helping and all the reasons, you know, it just there's all these layers of risk. Now for the egg donor, <clears throat> it's a little bit different. Um, and keep in mind, egg donors and surrogates take fertility drugs in order to unnaturally do what our bodies naturally do. So for the egg donor, she has immediately um, exposed herself to short-term risk because she's taking high dose fertility drugs and putting her ovaries into sort of a hyperdrive mode to produce lots and lots and lots of eggs, which again, our bodies are not meant to produce lots and lots and lots of eggs. But because of the financial components, if you're paying an egg donor, say 10 or $15,000, you don't want one egg or two eggs, you know, you want 20 or 30 or whatever. So those, those drugs and that um, putting her ovaries into hyperdrive puts her into what is often called um, a condition called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And the ovaries get big like grapefruits, there's a lot of fluid, there's a lot of swelling. You can see in their chats, they're talking to each other about how they look like they're nine months pregnant, they can't buckle their jeans, you know, get their pants on. Some of them talk about being short of breath because there's so much extra fluid that, you know, and the fluids in their bellies and that puts pressure on your lungs. So they have all those short-term risks. And in our film, Exploitation, two of the women had a stroke immediately in that short-term phase of being the egg donation process. Then there's the risk of the anesthesia and the actual surgery to retrieve the eggs. You know, in our film, one of the women, when she went into the operating room to have her eggs re retrieved, they accidentally nicked an artery, but they didn't pick it up right away. So when she was in recovery and she was a medical student, right? You want smart, pretty medical student eggs. When she was in the recovery room, she knew enough from her medical school training that something was wrong. She was in so much pain. She couldn't stand up. She was weak. They took her back into the OR and they found that she had been bleeding for like six hours. So they had to repair that bleed. So the, you know, those are the kinds of short-term risks that these women have. Longer term, you know, I know a lot of egg donors who've gone on to struggle with their own fertility issues. Um, and so you know, even though you'll see in all the advertisement, your fertility will not be harmed or damaged. That's just untrue. Um, and then also longer term is, is just the, un, the unknown and the known cancer risks. So, you know, one of the published research articles I worked on with two of my colleagues, um, Dr. Jennifer Schneider, whose daughter was a three-time egg seller who went on and died of uh, cancer. She was the lead author in that. And we just reported a case report on women who were otherwise healthy 
who went on and developed as very young women breast cancer. And we know young women don't normally get breast cancer. And we know that egg donors are screened out for a history of breast cancer because nobody's going to pay $15,000 to an egg donor who has a history or a family history of, of breast cancer or any cancer for that matter. So the egg donor has those immediate short-term risks and then the longer term risk too. A defensive surrogacy that I have seen a lot um, coming from many different camps is that it is a form of employment or, or work or a vocation um, like, like anything else that a woman might do. Um, and that if we um, recognize it as, as work, then you can make it non-exploitative um, through like workers' rights reforms or regulation of the industry. What is your take on, um, on that, on that yeah. argument? Yeah, I, I hear that a lot. And there's actually a, a book out there that I read, Wombs in Labor, written by a, an Indian feminist woman. Um, who makes that argument that, you know, surrogates ought to be able to unionize and organize and barter for higher wages and, you know, that, you know, that she you know, sees it as work. And, you know, it's sort of, you know, I, I, for one, I don't see pregnancy as work. You know, you don't grow up as a little girl and go, I want to be a paid surrogate for my job when I grow up. You know, what do I study in college to, to have that as a career option? Um, you know, you can't advance, you don't get promoted. You know, when you think of other jobs, you know, if you do a good job and you're a Starbucks barista or something, you know, the next thing you might get promoted to store manager, you know, the, 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 the head buyer of what kind of croissants and muffins are we going to offer our customers in the morning? You know, so you can't advance up the corporate ladder in surrogacy. Um, so it's, you know, it's not meaningful work. You know, if you truly have a, a, a a job, you know, surrogates age out, you know, you reach a point where you're too old to sell your eggs or to rent your womb. Um, and, you know, and not unlike other jobs that you can do till, you know, up until your eighties or till whenever you choose to retire or, or quit, you know, you will, your body will age out. And so you can't do your job anymore. If we're going to, if we're going to play that surrogate, but I just reject it as no, you know, I can't be a, a professional organ donor and sell my organs, you know, eventually I'm going to run out, you know, if I try to go to the blood bank every week and get blood, if I try to give air, you know, donate my skin to burn patients and give my kidney and, you know, eventually you'll just, you'll, you know, so you don't make these kind of arguments that, that, you know, parceling out your body and giving bits and pieces of your body away is a job. What, uh, what do you think of people who, or what do you think of the idea that surrogacy should be uh, defended as a choice or constitutes a right that either women have or that people who want to become parents have. Yeah, well, and, and obviously what I'm about to say applies to the people who say egg donors should be able to sell their eggs, their eggs, you know, and they're not using them, they want to sell them. Um, you know, I think the whole rights language is just one, it's just dangerous because there's no bottom to that. Um, you know, and, and no one, I always say no one has a right to a child. Now, if you have a child that comes out of your body, that is truly your child, um, you know, genetically, biologically, you know, you have a right for that. You, you shouldn't be able, some government can't say, well, that person has a right to build a family any way they want. They can't be able, should be able to come in and take your child away because their rights, you know, usurp your rights and they're rich and you're poor and they're educated and you're not. So, you know, even though you've had this child, you know, they have the right to your child. So I just think, you know, I, I just wrote an article, I just finished reading this article today on the whole area of fertility preservation and transgender medicine. So before men, women, girls, boys transition to the opposite sex, which I don't think you can do, you can pretend to do it, but you can't do it. You know, they're offered to bank their eggs, freeze their sperm, you know, so that when they transition to the other sex, you know, a woman who now lives as a man can go back and get her eggs to hire a surrogate and get a sperm donor so she can have a baby now that she's a man. I mean, it's just, it's just, there's no end to the insanity. When, once you frame it as, well, it's my body and I have the right. Um, and the second element of that is, you know, there's plenty of things we don't have a right to do with our body. I can't put myself up on eBay today as a slave. 
and auction myself off to the highest bidder. I can say, well, damn it, it's my body, it's my life. And if I want to sell myself to somebody and be their slave, you know, you can't do that. I mean, these are absurd, exa- absurd examples. I mean, I can't sell my kidney. You know, we have a law that forbids the buying and selling of organs. Well, I could say, well, it's my kidney. And if I want to sell it to the highest bidder, I should be able to do what I want. Across the femisphere. To women worldwide. Worldwide. To women worldwide. Radical feminist media. To break the sound barrier. Break the sound barrier. Break the sound barrier. Break the sound barrier. Radical feminist media. To break the sound barrier. This is your, 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 your grassroots community radio station. Your radio station. Grassroots. This is your grassroots community radio station. Women's Women's Liberation Liberation Radio Radio News. News. That was Strange Harvest from Tempers. Now we turn to an interview Aurora did with Dr. Renata Klein. Renata is a biologist, sociologist, and feminist health activist who has been campaigning against surrogacy and other reproductive technologies since the early 1980s. She is the co-founder of FinRage, the feminist international network of resistance to reproductive and genetic engineering, as well as co-founder and editor of SpinFX Press. Renata's 2017 book, Surrogacy, A Human Rights Violation, stands as necessary reading for all women concerned about reproductive exploitation. One of the reasons why um, we chose to do surrogacy for this uh, this month's podcast is that it has been in the news recently, um, and not for the usual sort of heartwarming stories of celebrities and their purchased babies and how lovely that all is, um, but because of what is happening with the war in Ukraine and how that has bought, brought um, to light the situation of so-called surrogate mothers in that country. Um, could you just comment on uh, the, the circumstances for the yeah. women used as surrogates there? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's totally that. heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking. Um, and it's not unexpected because in 2017, uh, a, a good uh, U, um, Australian program, uh, television program, the, um, did a fantastic program on uh, Ukraine and was very, very critical of the uh, the big clinics there and how you know women are exploited. I mean, Ukrainian women are amongst the poorest, uh, certainly in Europe. And um, it, it was just, they were just exploited by foreigners. 
uh, and many, many from the US, but countries like Australia too. So when the when and that actually foreign correspondent report also documented how heartless these so called commissioning parents, which are called actually baby buyers, can be because uh, there was a child born, um, he was very disabled, and they basically just said, no, nah, we're not getting that. We don't want it. So this poor little child was left uh, in Ukraine, and it was only thanks to a nurse who really took it on and made sure it had uh, appropriate thera therapy so it could maybe walk one day was looking after this child. Now, I mean, it's just a human rights violation. It's nothing else. And it's disgusting. It really is. And a shame for this industry that pulls it on. So now with the war, uh, that highlighted, you know, how horrible, horrible these baby buyers are. Because when the war um, started, uh, there were quite a few papers in the Australian press. They were all about the parents who said, oh, no, oh, no, we have to go to Ukraine and we have to actually save our baby. We have to go and get our baby. And very rarely was there even a question, well, where is actually the mother? Where is actually the woman, the pregnant woman, and is she safe? And what are we going to offer her? So it was all about, we have to go and get the baby out. And um, then there were heroic tales uh, because Australia said, don't go to Ukraine, it's too dangerous. But no, these people went over there and, you know, in some instances, they got, quote, their baby. Uh, it, it was just the worst of its kind. But the press in general, they don't ever really focus on what this means for women. They just focus on oh, these poor, poor people who are infertile or in the case of gay men now believe that, you know, first the marriage day and the wedding cake and now they need to have a baby. It's become really kind of like very fashionable. Uh, they, they, they're now so called socially infertile. And of course they have to have their baby. So we should just offer them a market of women that they can exploit. Um, it's horrible, you know, and it, it really uh, it showed, showed up what actually, unfortunately, is still happening in Ukraine. How did Ukraine come to be such an international hub um, for the surrogacy industry? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, of course, you know, now we are all very much behind Ukraine as they have to cope with this very horrible invasion from Russia and the dreadful murders that the Russians are committed. And so I think very few people are game to be sort of like critical of Ukraine. But let's face it, Ukraine over the last decade or so has really morphed into almost an ex had morphed, I should say, passed into almost um, a perfect example of what liberalized neo-capitalism can do. You know, it was not just a hub for, it had become not just a hub for the surrogacy industry with many, many big clinics, you know, starting, uh, but also uh, the, the, uh, the sex industry was there and women were trafficked from Ukraine to other states in Europe, especially in Germany, where uh, prostitution is legal and Ukrainian women are often very beautiful, poor, and they're lured to uh, German, into German Brussels. And Germany is often called the, the Brussel of Europe. And that has actually now continued over uh, during the war, although there have been many organizations who had met the women when they came in with the trains to Germany and said, do not go uh, off with unknown men. They do not have your best interest at heart. What are your thoughts on the distinction that, that people will try to make about commercial surrogacy being obviously harmful, but altruistic surrogacy um, being uh, a more sort of like lovely and rewarding experience for all parties, um, including potentially the child, because there's not the, ostensibly there's not the money, the monetary transaction. 
Yeah, I'm totally against that. And I actually really uh, disagree with this whole premise. Um, surrogacy is bad, unethical, whether it's for money or whether it's for love. And in fact, uh, we've had some hor horrendous stories in, um, in Australia. But I mean, also, I just recently read one from England where a so-called altruistic surrogate suffered for years and had PTSD and um, longed for her child that in the end she didn't want to give away, but there was a contract, so she had to give it away. Um, we actually published a book called Broken Bones, Surrogate Mothers Speak Out. And it's about 15 stories by birth mothers, egg donors, and two by so-called altruistic surrogate, surrogacies from Australia. And it mostly, not often, not always, but mostly happens in families. And it starts like, you know, one sister or one cousin, in this case, it was a cousin, um, had cancer treatment. That meant she couldn't uh, get pregnant anymore and her cousin said who loved her very much who's younger than her loved her very much said I'll have a baby for you I had a baby although she had that first her first child was had a very traumatic birth so from even from that they should not have allowed her to do it but nobody said anything so she said I'll do it I'll do it and everything seemed to be fine and, and she got pregnant really quickly and then the table started to turn the commissioning mother uh, couldn't bear the thought that her cousin, her fertile cousin, was now pregnant and she was not. And so she started to say from the beginning, oh, there won't be a child, you'll have a miscarriage. Which, you know, is not very nice when you're pregnant and feel have morning sickness and all that, don't feel all that good. When uh, the woman for whom you are doing it, because you love her, tells you that there's not going to be a baby. And she refused to come with two medical examinations with her. When it came to the birth, because there was no stillbirth, there was no miscarriage, um, it was totally horrible. They ripped the child away from her. And at that point, she started the 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 mother who's called Odette in our book, she couldn't use her real name uh, because the family court forbid her. The family court allowed her to talk about her story but not use her real name. Anyway, Odette uh, became very ill, very suicidal, missed her little boy very much and tried to get him back. And so they ended up in front of the family court and after long and protracted and expensive uh, you know, uh, negotiations, um, she didn't win. The child stayed with the parents and the mother, her cousin, uh, continued to really have nervous and continue to have, be very unstable, have nervous breakdowns and so on and so on. And, you know, this is now six years from when this baby boy was uh, born. Odette pleaded for a photo, for anything. Uh, could she see him? No. And uh, because the court, the judge, in his you know, wisdom, had said that it would be up to the commissioning parents to decide if the birth mother could ever see her son. You know, that's patriarchal courts for you. And six years later, it's still going through the court. It is still not finished. I also want to say something that one thing we have to, to, to do when we talk about surrogacy, we have to point and ask questions about why it is such a good female trait to be selflessness and to be nice and kind and always put yourself last and do things for others. Because this is really something, and I don't believe in any way that this is innate for women, not at all. It's socialized. Uh, under patriarchy, little girls do best when they're nice and kind and lovely with frilly dresses and they please everyone. And that goes on during our lives. You know, we have to be nice, kind, understanding. Uh, when a man beats us, we have to say, oh, yeah, I wasn't very nice, but, you know, I love him, we stay and 
more beatings and we still love him. And then unfortunately, sometimes I'm dead, but you know, I'm dead. So it goes on and on. And so many people laud this selflessness and laud this, um, this, these traits in women and say altruism is so good and that's what the world should be like. And my answer is no. Uh, yes, of course, it's nice to be nice to your neighbor and to a friend and all of that. You don't have to be horrible. But at some point, you have to ask yourself the question, what is it doing to me? What is it doing to my life, to my body? And you have to say, sorry, I, I can't do it. I know it's horrible for you and I wish I could, but I can't do it because it would be very detrimental to my life. Something that I really appreciate about your book um, is that you do talk about how um, surrogacy as a both a practice and a business um, has implications for women collectively as a, a sex class beyond the, the harms to individual women um, who are... Um, acting as as surrogate or birth mothers in that industry. So could you just talk about what um, what you think the collective harms to women as a class are of the persistence of, of this practice and industry? Yeah, I agree with you. I think there are enormous collective harms for women as a sex class, which is what we have to, the term we have to use, you know, now. Um, because it's like with prostitution when, and pornography also. When men think that women are just holes to be filled and that they are the, whole, the ones who fill the holes, uh, that's actually true even of surrogacy because, you know, you put an embryo into the womb and you could say, well, that's a hole in a woman. That's all we're interested in. We're not really interested in anything else. Uh, and... In prostitution is exactly the same. Um, in the trans, they're trying to do the same. Um, it just means that we continue to live in a society where, uh, as Sheila Jeffries actually calls it, the male sex right rules supreme. And Spinif Express is very shortly publishing um, Sheila's latest book, which, which is called penile imperialism, uh, the male sex right and women's subordination. Um, it's a totally brilliant book. It really is very hard to read, <laughs> very hard to edit it was because um, to read about these sex practices that men um, do and think it's perfectly normal you know, whether it's kink or whether it's um, pedophilia, that there's a growing, growing movement of men who thinks there's nothing wrong with having sex with children. They like it, you know, children like having sex with men. And then there's <laughs> a particular special group, they call themselves um, MAPS, and um, they're the good ped pedophiles because they say, oh, we really long... We long for children, but we're not going to do anything. We're not going to have sex with them. We're just around them and we adore them and we love them. There's nothing wrong with that. It's that a good uh, pedophiles and people really want us to, to sort of accept that. And uh, it's that male concept of, uh, as Sheila says, the male sex right, which I actually believe that until women really understand what that means, fully understand what that means, and that reading that, that new book will help all of us to understand that women will not ever reach um, full personhood in patriarchy. I'm not talking about equality because, you know, I don't want to be equal to a man. I want to change the system. We want structural change. We don't want women to become like men who become higher numbers of CEOs. Well, that's okay, you know, but that's not the change that we need and want. And that's always been so totally fantastic about radical feminism. That we're not just going for like liberal feminists. We're not just going for some kind of facelift, you know, for, for, for women. We actually really want change at the bottom from the bottom up we want, stru we want stru <coughs> structural change
This is Joe Brew, and I love listening to WLRN. Surrogacy is a misogynistic, capitalistic practice that exploits and commodifies women's bodies. By now, that should be clear. Like prostitution, surrogacy makes the female body into a product, specifically a sexual product. Surrogate mothers, both the ones who sell their eggs and the ones who rent out their wombs, are underpaid to go through one of the most dangerous and physically taxing experiences possible for women. Also that infertile women, and women unwilling to deal with pregnancy can become mothers to biological children, or to give men, both heterosexual and gay, the privilege of biological fatherhood. What underlies the surrogacy industry is ultimately a sense of entitlement. People who buy children through the surrogacy process feel entitled, not just to parenthood, which could be achieved through adoption, but to their own biological offspring. They want what they want, and they don't care what price someone else has to pay for their desire to be fulfilled. These people are egotistical enough that they must see their genes replicated at any cost. This attitude is prevalent in heterosexual men, so it's no surprise that they're willing to fork over the money for a surrogate when their wives either can't get pregnant or don't want to experience pregnancy. I don't expect better from them. What's disappointing, as always, is the betrayal that happens between women in this industry. The women who buy other women's reproductive power and labor are key drivers without whom the surrogacy industry wouldn't exist. We're talking about women using, exploiting, and dehumanizing other women. Capitalism simply did what it's designed to do, recognized an opportunity to generate profit and turned it into a market. But unlike most markets, this one is based on the buying and selling of human beings themselves. Commercial surrogacy, like slavery and prostitution, is based on a transaction where human beings pay for access to the bodies of other human beings. And you could argue that there are actually two separate human products in a surrogacy transaction. The mother who undergoes pregnancy and the child itself. This transaction denaturalizes human reproduction, often circumventing nature's barriers to reproduction, whether infertility or homosexuality, and disconnecting the creation process from parenthood. Surrogate mothers are usually erased from the creation story altogether, left unmentioned or only acknowledged as carriers, not mothers. Considering they're the only ones in the transaction to undergo any physical risk, this treatment is insulting. It's also a lie. A woman doesn't carry a fetus in her body, she builds it with her own. Otherwise, the fertility industry could grow an embryo into a baby outside a woman's body in a lab. I want to address the issue of gay men fathering children via surrogacy, as this is often the kind of surrogacy heterosexual feminists attack and stake their anti-surrogacy politics on. An overwhelming majority of couples who use commercial surrogacy to reproduce are heterosexual. Statistics on the sexual orientation and marital status of surrogacy clients are difficult to find, but one informal American study conducted in 2016 found that only 10 to 20 percent of surrogacy clients across 10 American cities were gay male couples. The other 80 to 90 percent were heterosexual. These numbers line up with the ratio of heterosexual to homosexual people in the general population and the rate of desire for children in the heterosexual versus homosexual population. According to the CDC circa 2020, only 15% of same-sex couples in the U.S. have underage children, and same-sex couples are four times more likely than heterosexual couples to adopt their children. That's true despite how difficult it still is in many states for homosexuals to get approved for adoption. Only 6.6% of gay male couples had children in their household, compared to 22.5% of lesbian couples. 
Based on these numbers, a very small percentage of gay men in the U.S. have used surrogacy to become parents. Most homosexuals are child-free, whereas most heterosexuals want and have kids. Because of how expensive surrogacy is, many gay men could never afford it even if they wanted to use the method. But when money is no object, heterosexual clients still outnumber homosexual clients in commercial surrogacy. Just look at celebrities who have had children via surrogate in the last 10 years. Most have been heterosexual couples or single heterosexual women, not gay men. It's true that gay men, whether single or coupled, are exploiting surrogate mothers for their reproductive capabilities. But those gay men represent a small minority of parents who pay women for their eggs and wounds. Most parents who used a surrogate are heterosexual, and that includes heterosexual men married to women. Yet I almost never see heterosexual feminists call out their fellow heterosexuals when they talk about the unethical, misogynistic, and exploitative nature of commercial surrogacy. I don't see them doing it when it's a celebrity het couple, and I also don't see them talk about ordinary heterosexuals who went the surrogacy route. As far as I'm concerned, these het feminists who only criticize gay men for fathering children via surrogacy are using the issue to vent their homophobia. They don't have an issue with surrogacy so much as they have an issue with gay men fathering and raising children. If you really have a problem with surrogacy and want to see it disappear, you should be criticizing and denouncing heterosexual society's pro-natalism. A biological urge to reproduce may be a factor for lesbians and gay men who want children, but the social pressure to be parents and the social status that goes along with parenthood are other factors that can't be ignored. Child-free adults are still a small minority in the heterosexual population, and they get flack for their choice not to reproduce, especially the child-free women. And that is despite their heterosexuality. Mainstream heterosexual culture is aggressively pro-natalist, even going so far as to harbor a compulsory motherhood position in its far-right religious corners. To be the ultimate, normal, successful, respectable adult in heterosexual society, you have to marry someone of the opposite sex and have babies. It's in that cultural atmosphere that gay men and lesbians grow up and live out their adult lives. While plenty of heterosexuals don't want gay men and lesbians raising kids at all, whether adopted or biological, other heterosexuals approve of it and will reward gay men and lesbians for being parents the same way they reward them for entering traditional monogamous marriages and being gender conforming, with higher social status and better treatment. You can't glorify motherhood and reproduction reinforce the heteronormative hierarchy of women in which mothers are more privileged than child-free women, then turn around and complain when people, whether het women or gay men, resort to surrogacy instead of accepting their childlessness or adopting. You can't treat parenthood as an inevitable and universal human experience or the point of life itself, then condemn people for using exploitative means to achieve it. You can't treat homosexual parents better than child-free homosexuals. Then get mad when those homosexual parents reproduce in a way you find morally unacceptable. You can't have it both ways. When we say surrogacy is wrong, we say it because the health, safety, well-being, and survival of surrogate mothers are more important than anyone's desire to have biological children. If you want all the would-be clients of commercial surrogacy to internalize that, you have to acknowledge that biologically reproducing doesn't make you any better or more special than people who don't. Thanks for listening to WLRN's 76th edition podcast on surrogacy. WLRN would like to thank our guests this month for sharing their views on the harms of surrogacy. Thank you so much, Jennifer Lal and Renata Klein, for speaking with us. Until next time, this is April No signing off on another WLRN podcast. If you like what you are hearing and would like to donate to the cause of Feminist Community Radio, please visit our WordPress site and click on the donate button. Check out our merch tab to get a nice gift in exchange for your donation. And if you are interested in joining our team, 
We are always looking for new volunteers to conduct interviews, write blog posts, post to our Facebook and other social media pages, and do other tasks to keep us moving forward as a collective of media activist women. Thanks for listening. This is Emily Ann signing off for now. And I'm Thistle Patterson. Thanks for tuning in. Next month, we'll focus our program on interviews I captured in the woods of Michigan this summer with musician Jory Costello of Big Bad Gina and artist Emily Fay. The show will focus on the importance of women-only cultural gatherings to the development of our theory and practice as feminists. Our handcrafted podcasts always come out the first Thursday of the month, so look for it on Thursday, September 1st. If you'd like to receive our newsletter that notifies you when each podcast, music show, and interviews are released, please sign up for our newsletter on the WLRN WordPress site. Stay strong in the struggle, and thanks for listening. This is Jenna, signing off on another edition of WLRN's monthly handcrafted podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Spinster, Overit, and SoundCloud, in addition to our WordPress site. Thanks for listening. And this is Aurora. Our monthly podcasts are always crafted with tender loving care and in solidarity with women worldwide. Thanks so much for your support. We would love to hear from you, so please do share, like, and comment widely. But how will we find our way out of this? What is the antidote for the patriarchal kiss? How will we find what needs to be shown and then after that where is home